Well, thank you very much, Edgar. Happy Wednesday to everybody. So this is the final presentation in the corn series. And today we'll be doing a little bit of a review of what has already been discussed. And then more importantly, talking about how I, in my experience, have adapted this technology to use in an efficient operating theater setting. First, what we'll do is we'll do a little bit of a recap of the balance box technology. This is a short video that goes through some of the steps that you have seen previously. This demonstrates here the acquisition of ligament length under constant tension after the initial tibial cut has been made and the resultant graph on the right. Quickly going through the virtual morphing, determining the femoral preparation and the predicted ligament balance that should be the result of these permutations. Affixing the Omni robot to the femoral tracker, giving clear view of the femur for femoral preparation with the Omni robot. Trialing with the balance spot in place, seeing if what we had predicted is indeed the result that we get on the new graph. And then of course, determination at the surgeon's preference if any soft tissue releases or adjustments are necessary at that time. We can easily compare initial and final stability and balancing. Now we have been collecting data using this technique, as you have heard previously, for a couple of years. Initially, we had some hypotheses and assumptions about what targets, given our previous history of non-navigated knee replacements, that we should be shooting for. Assumptions such as a knee that has equal ligament length medially and laterally at certain points of flexion perhaps might do better than knees that are not balanced in such fashion. The nice thing about what we have achieved over the past couple of years is that we have collected patient reported outcomes over six centers in America using this technology, and we have started to analyze the data and perhaps come up with some guidelines that can help us understand what our targets might want to be. For example, we see in full extension that patients who have ligaments that are within a millimeter of each other, or perhaps one millimeter tighter medially than laterally, those patients do report better outcomes in terms of pain. Similarly, in mid-flexion, defined by us as between 30 and 50 degrees of flexion, Again, less than one millimeter difference medially to laterally in terms of length of the ligament shows better outcomes. And at 90 degrees of flexion, less than 1.5 millimeter difference. As you might expect, when these achievements are combined, meaning if you achieve your goal as outlined here, in more than one of these regions of flexion, the results are even better. This slide here shows, for example, if you achieve your goal in extension and flexion, you have a better result than just extension alone. And as you might expect, if all three are achieved, the patient reported outcomes are the best. So this has been very helpful as we go through and collect this information about patients. And you can probably see that if we extrapolate this, at some point what we hope to have is some very reasonable guidelines about all sorts of different parameters that will enable a surgeon to know what to shoot for to get historically proven best results. Another thing that we have heard in the previous sessions, Dr. Lawrence had talked a little bit about this, is the finding that long leg alignment did not necessarily correlate as strongly as one might have thought it would with outcomes and that in fact soft tissue balance had a greater effect on outcome than the alignment did. So what that means to us, practically speaking, is in theory, if perhaps we leave a knee in one or two degrees of varus or valgus, yet through that are able to achieve one or more of those three targets that we discussed previously in terms of medial lateral ligament balancing, 
that it's okay to do that according to the data that we've collected so far, that these patients do better than if we sacrifice the ligament balancing precision to get neutral alignment. Of course, the question is what is the safe limit of non-neutral alignment is an ongoing investigation. Similarly, you might expect that if we are able to predict our ligament balancing before we make our femoral preparation, and if we do it properly, that we might therefore reduce the need for soft tissue releases. Now, we probably can never eliminate them, and we have two cases later, which I'll give some examples. The second case example that I do have, I did do some soft tissue releasing at the end, but certainly it can reduce it if we predict as careful as we can with our bone cuts and know the resultant soft tissue balancing based on that. We do know that knees with increased soft tissue releases do report poor CU scores. So then, of course, this begs the question, when should a bone recut be performed rather than a release, again, ongoing investigation? The nice thing that we have now is that Corin and Omni had joined forces. We have access to the Corin Joint Arthroplasty Registry. We have not just national patients, but we have international data to compare. And what we have seen using the Corin Joint Arthroplasty Registry raises some questions. We see that a lot of patients that are coming to us for knee replacement actually are not our normal um, in liar type patients. A lot of these people have outliers of the femoral and or tibial anatomy. And what that means is that we might perceive these patients as being more difficult. They have more of a deformity. We expect that they need, they may need more soft tissue releases. So how are these patients handled with this technology? And a more important question perhaps, does this technology help me as a surgeon with these difficult or outlier patients and can this be done in a reasonable and efficient and worthwhile fashion in the operating room? So before we go on to a couple of cases and a little bit more detail as to operating room management, just a little background about myself. I'm a native of the state of Vermont. I graduated in 1991 from Harvard and Radcliffe Colleges with uh, the medical uh, background of linguistics and Arabic language. Graduated from Harvard Medical School in 1999, and then I went on to my internship in general surgery at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center to be followed at the same facility by the orthopedic residency. I then was fortunate enough to return back to Boston to be one of the four Otto O. Frank Fellows uh, in adult reconstruction, ending in the year 2005. In 2005, I left the East Coast and came west to Arizona and established a practice here at Flagstaff Bone and & Joint and have been at this same location since that time. For the past three years, I have done surgery at an orthopedic specialty hospital in Phoenix, and we have just opened our ambulatory surgery center with our first cases there, actually this week. So we are a private practice center. I have seven partners. Uh, we do not have medical students or residents. Uh, we do have certified first assists and physician's assistants that are both employed by and contracted with the group. And we have a very, very large geographic catchment area. So uh, unlike perhaps some of the larger metropolitan areas, uh, we will see patients from rural environments all the way from southern Utah, New Mexico, Colorado, and California. We actually have some patients travel from Canada as well. Uh, we are nearby to the town of Sedona, uh, which is a very large international seasonal population, and we do uh, have a lot of patients from around the world uh, who do come to us having spent some time in Sedona. So historically, what is it about myself that allowed me to um, adapt this technology easily? So going back historically, like many of you listening right now, you might have started with traditional knee replacement techniques. And indeed, when I first started here in Flagstaff in 2005, 
I did start without any navigation, so the traditional technique of intramedullary femoral guides, extramedullary tibial guides, and no navigation. Now, it's not because I wasn't familiar with it. In my fellowship, we actually had done some early brain lab navigation with total knee and total hip replacements. So I was certainly familiar with the navigation, but in the first year out of fellowship, I did not use this. It was pretty quick, though, that I came to realize that I really would like something additional. Um, in 2006, only a year into practice, I did seek out and begin using a commercially available navigation system. And um, initially, again, I'd started just like many people with a complete femoral first preparation, then going on to the tibia. It was very soon thereafter, however, that I started a modified technique with distal femur preparation first, then proximal tibia, and then the use of a tensioner primarily in flexion to assess my femoral component rotation, but also in extension to assess gaps. This, in many ways, were some of the early steps to adaptation of the later technology. It is true that navigation enabled us to become better surgeons. I do believe this, meaning we would get immediate real-time feedback on what we were doing. Now, it wasn't the balance spot technology that we have now, which has taken this many steps forward. But even at that time, we would make our distal femoral cut, and then we would register and validate that cut. And so we'd get immediate feedback on how accurate we were and what we were actually getting. And so through this, we were able to improve our precision and our understanding of how the bone reacts when we prepare it. This gave us more accurate bony alignments. Even at this stage, 10 years ago, we were using this navigation and in some ways attempting, even though we didn't really have the appropriate tools at hand like we have now, attempting to make modifications in our technique to predict what our post-procedure alignment was going to be. So, for example... We've all done this probably. You have a very, very tight varus knee. Well, if you're navigating, you may say, or you may not, but I would do this sometimes. Well, in an effort to reduce our soft tissue releases and to make it easier to balance at the end once our bone cuts are done, let's, let's rather than doing zero degree varus valgus on the femur, let's do one or maybe 1.5 degree varus. And perhaps we might do something similar on the tibia. You know, always within plus or minus one or two degrees, but we might do a little bit of this to help prepare the femur and the alignment of the knee afterwards such that we would reduce the necessity for soft tissue releases. I would do this for a long time. And in fact, it became a little bit uh, of a challenge to see how well we could prepare the bone, expecting how the alignment was going to be to see if we could indeed reduce our soft tissue releases at the end. So this is very much the precursor to what the balance bot is doing for us today. Going forward to July of 2017, this was the first omnibotics case that we did at my facility. Now, we did not have the balance spot at that time. We were using spacer blocks. So for the three-month time period between July and October, we were using the Omni robot, but we did not have the balance spot at this time. Very quickly, just a three-month span, the balance spot became available to us, and we used this initially in October of 2017. Now, despite all of the perhaps anticipated challenges of using new technology in the operating room, it's really very accurate to say that I did probably two or three balance spot cases, and I really didn't want to go back to not using the balance spot that quickly. I remember early on, we didn't have enough balance bots at all of these centers to go around, and so we would do a couple of cases, and then perhaps the third case of the day, we would have to go back to the spacer block. And again, I really, even that early on, preferred the balance bot because it was so clear, even after two or three cases, that the resulting soft tissue balance was really just so far superior to what we were able to achieve previously. Now, on a busy day, Prior to uh, the coronavirus uh, pandemic, of course, 
we would probably do an average of eight to 10 cases per day. And I do about a 50-50 split. So our schedulers are very good. We will have usually half knees and half hips. And that actually is very important. That does really help with the flow of the day. So on a busy day, again, we have four or five knees and four or five hips. I do, like many of you do, uh, have two rooms to do this. I work at an orthopedic specialty hospital, as I had said previously, and so this is really, I must admit, set up for this very nicely. It is so specialized that, in fact, some of the scrub techs really prefer hips and some prefer knees. Of course, they are cross-trained, but in general, the hip scrub will stay with the hip room, and that goes for nurses as well, and the knee scrubs will stay in the knee room. Okay. I do approximately six 25, 650 cases per year in this fashion. So, again, precise division of labor. This is helpful. Now, all of you may not have this, um, but this is helpful, and this is just one of the ways that we have developed some efficiencies with our operating team. So, how we do this. It is true that setting up the robotic system does take slightly longer than setting up a hip replacement. So this doesn't slow us down because what we have learned is we always start with the hip room first. And actually the scrub techs came to me with this and let me know because there are some things behind the scenes that we as surgeons don't necessarily see and don't appreciate. Uh, but they came to me and let me know that the knee scrubs really appreciated that extra five or 10 minutes to get set up in the morning. Therefore, consistently we start in the hip room. Okay. So while we are setting up and, and doing the total hip replacement, that gives the scrubs in the knee room that extra time they need so that they're not rushed. They don't have to get to the hospital any earlier than the other scrubs do to get this set up. We do have two scrub techs per case, and that is very helpful. So one of the scrub techs can be setting up the robotic system with the Corin representative in the room, registering um, the robotic system and making sure that everything is accurate while the other scrub is doing the standard knee setup. It goes without saying that staff retention is critical and as much sway as you have in this matter, it is critical that you, that you use that. I mean, <clears throat> simple things like creating a positive operating room environment, um, making sure that people have a reason to stay with you and um, not want to leave and go someplace else, uh, it really can't be underestimated that every bit of effort you make in that regard is helpful. And my physician assistant and certified first assist are two people that have both been with me for 12 years. Now, many people ask, how do you set up this operating room? Um, so, for a standard total knee without the robotic system, most scrub techs will use two mayo stands that are set up at the foot of the table on which they will put their Z retractors, their rongeurs, their other equipment. Bringing the robotic system, which has essentially two pieces, you have the balance box and then you have the Omni robot that affixes itself or that we affix to the knee. Um, so you have two pieces, that is a separate bit of equipment. How we have handled this is we have a third mayo stand and you can see in the middle of the screen here that uh, the left-hand photograph shows this mayo stand. Okay. This mayo stand is located on the non-operative side of the patient. So I will stand as the surgeon on the operative side, and I will have one other assistant on my side. That's assistant B. Assistant A is the primary or lead assistant on the opposite side of the table from me. And this mayo stand is behind that individual. So you can see how the cords are managed. The scrub tech will loop enough cord for the excursion needed by myself to take that instrument and bring it to the field, but it's clipped to the side of the mayo with a loop such that I cannot pull contaminated cord up from the floor. There's enough cord left on the floor so the corn representative can grab the cord and attach it to the equipment as needed. The other important piece here is that this is a freestanding mayo that at the end of the case, this can be taken away by the Corin representative, and he or she can start disassembling pieces and get them ready for reprocessing before we've even finished the case. Now, 
of course, we do hope we have enough sets for every need, but if there's a problem with sterilization or a problem with anything, we want to turn these over and have extras available just in case. Okay. So technique. For anyone who has navigated before, the initial steps of this procedure are identical to any navigation system. So, of course, you come in. Perhaps, if you're lucky, the patient has already been prepped and draped. You come in, you're gla down, gloved, you do your timeout, and you do your surgical approach again, whichever surgical, surgical approach you like to do. Then, navigation arrays are assembled, again, just like any navigation system. And people will tell you, and I've been doing this for over 10 years, in general, from initial incision through approach, placement of the tibial trackers, placement of the femoral trackers, and registration takes approximately, for myself, seven minutes, give or take a little bit. But on average, that's what it is. The steps, of course, morphing and landmarking, okay? Then we'll go through the tibial planning, the balance spot, and the decision and implementation of the plan. The nice thing about this robotic technology is that this does not change any of your philosophies or beliefs about knee replacement. However you like to approach knee replacement, however you feel about it, what tibial slope you like, how much tibia you like to cut, even if you want to cut the femur first, it is advised based on our data collection that the most accurate results have come in our series from tibial first preparation, but we have surgeons cutting the femur first. Whatever you like, this technology will work for you. In terms of learning curve, there are many parts of this to which learning curves can be associated. Coming from a navigation background, the learning curve was, was quite quick for me and my team. They had already learned how to register navigation. This was just a small additional step. I would say within the first five cases, we were convinced that this gave us superior results. And probably within 10 to 20 cases, we had most of the issues worked out. At this point, prior to going into some specifics of cases, I'd like to see if there are any questions. Thank you so far, Dr. Randall. Uh, we did have a question around the learning curve and about whether, um, about whether there was a difference in the learning curve between you and your assistants, given the additional, uh, given the additional technology in the OR. I was wondering if you could comment on that. Sure. So a couple specifics. Um, first of all, there, of course, this is a different technology related, very similar to traditional navigation, but there are some differences. Uh, so one thing that did take a little learning time for both myself and my assistant was the correct application and placement of the femoral navigation pin. And the reason why this is important is because it is the same array that is your navigation platform to which you, halfway through the case, affix the robotic system. And so there's an additional level of precision that this takes uh, in terms of knowing where to put those pins. And where this comes uh, to the fore is the robotic arm needs to be able to get to the position of all of your cuts. And if you place the pins in a slightly improperly angled position, you don't want to learn later on that you can't allow the robot to get down to, for example, your posterior cut. So that was the first issue that we had in terms of learning curve. And that's myself and the assistants because we both apply this together. Um, and that probably took maybe about 15 to 20 cases, I would estimate, for us to fully understand all the nuances of that. Um, one thing that I do not do, but my two assistants together do, is exactly, as I said previously, putting that robot onto the distal femur and affixing it. We'll see in just a minute when we look at the slide that this can be challenging. Um, one person has to hold the robot in a precise position, while the other person has to tighten two screws. And uh, you have to hold it in proper alignment in two planes as you do this. And I think it is critical for two people together to do this. Um, but that was something that took them a little bit of time to work out. Now they, they can do it in 10 seconds. Um, I would estimate, again, it probably took that standard 15 to 20 
initial learning curve cases to figure out the principles of application. And then, of course, yeah, as you go on, we all know as surgeons that the more cases you do, the better you get at everything. So the learning curve never stops. But to get over that initial hurdle such that you can do it properly and with reasonable efficiency, that's my answer for that. Um, I think for the techs in the room, the techs are pretty skilled. Most techs who have used navigation have seen a lot of this before. The only thing that would be new for them is the proper assembly, again, of the robot. There's a casing that has to be held carefully while the uh, representative drops another piece that is non-sterile inside, and that takes a little bit of skill to figure out how to do that, probably no more than five cases. Great, thank you. We actually do have another question around uh, your comment there on the, um, fixing the balance bot, uh, sorry, fixing the only bot. Uh, do you take a different approach for particularly high BMI patients? Oh, well, I, I do not, but on the other hand, to be honest with you, I do limit the BMI of my patients. So our hospitals, by and large, will not permit patients with BMI of 40 or greater to have surgery here. So um, the hospital I work at has a rule, BMI 40 or greater is not permitted. Patients must lose weight to get their BMI below 40. Now, that being said, still, of course, you can have someone with a BMI of 39 who has a very heavy leg. If I, in the office, see a patient has a heavy enough leg, such I think that they're going to have a lot of difficulties with knee flexion, I will still ask them to lose a little bit of weight. So. To be fair, I don't see any super morbidly obese patients. If I did, I likely might change the position. As it stands currently, I do not. I do the same position for every patient. It is true that some patients are a little more difficult, and I will have the assistant hold the soft tissues back with an Army Navy retractor. Sometimes that's necessary. In my population, though, even with BMIs 38, 39, that's pretty unusual to have to do. Great, thank you. Um, that's all the questions for now, and I'd encourage people to send in more questions as they come up. All right. Okay, so the next part, we're going to take a look at two cases. Now, I'll go through all of the steps in case one, um, and then case two, you will have seen these steps. It will be a different illustration, but we'll go through case two probably a little bit more quickly. We'll take a little more time on case one. So case one is, is representative of a more standard, you know, quote, easier, end quote, type patient, one with not a lot of deformity, not a lot of ligament laxity. Okay. So we can see in this particular case here that this patient has a knee that is three degree, three degree varus and two degree flexion. So just to be very clear how we came to this screen for people who have not seen this or have not navigated before. We've done our surgical approach. We've affixed our tibial and femoral trackers. We have gone through the morphing and registration process, found the hip center, et cetera. Okay. Once that is all done, now we are looking at the patient's preoperative kinematics. No bone cuts have been done at this time. So to do that, what I do, once the registration is complete, I will take the knee through a range of motion. And of course, as you all know, when the knee bends more, we are actually getting hip range of motion in here as well. Um, but what I'm doing is I'm stressing the knee, varus valgus stress, and trying to collect all of these points from, you can see here, about 115 degrees down to about 2 degrees. And we're looking, the width of these green bars show us the laxity of the knee at these points, okay? So most knees, or many knees that you will see these preoperative curves on, they will be widest at about 30 degrees. That's likely not unexpected. The other information you can get from this screen is the overall alignment at each point in flexion. So you can see at 115 degrees, uh, we're approximately, we're just slightly to the left of that middle line, maybe one or two degrees of varus. And then at 30 degrees, you can see because of that wide green bar, it does go to the left of the three-degree mark. So we probably have maybe 
four or five degree varus there, and then at two degrees, it comes back to the three degrees varus that you see there. So this is our pre-operative alignment. Now, this curve is nice because at the very end, you will see your post-operative alignment, and you can put them side by side to compare. Patients really like this, um, and a lot of patients will request to have this data loaded onto the computer during their post-operative visit such that they can take a look at it. Timing. Morphing the femur. Now, this is in the addition. This starts at that seven-minute point. So, as I told you before, surgical approach of fixing landmarks, that's about seven minutes. Now, we start with the morphing and landmarking. Average, four minutes. That preoperative kinematic acquisition that I discussed previously, that process, approximately an additional minute. And this is an average over many cases. Now, once we have done that, the next step that you as a surgeon have to decide what to do is your tibial cut. So this, again, has been recommended that we do see the most predictable and precise results with this technique with a tibial first cut. It does make sense. We have done revisions this way for years. We all know that the tibia is a nice neutral platform on which to build your extension and flexion gaps just like you would in the revision situation. This takes some of that thinking and applies it to the primary situation. Is it a little more difficult? It may be. You do get used to it quickly. Um, but, yes, it is a little bit of a change. So here you can see that I have decided that I'm going to take 8 millimeters medial and 2 millimeters lateral, shooting for a 0 degree varus valgus cut and 2 degree posterior slope. You as a surgeon can determine exactly how you want to do this. These parameters are not set for you. This is your judgment. So I've made the cut, and then on the right-hand side of the screen, I have validated it. And you see, I'm, you know, you're off and off a little tiny bit. This is what we got. I accepted this. Six minutes additional elapsed. Once your tibia has been cut, this, again, is your neutral platform on which you place your balance spot for the next step in data acquisition. So the balance spot goes in. It is suggested that you start in flexion and slowly bring the knee out to extension. As you do so, you look at the graph on the right, and you will see the graph populating with we have set this balance spot at 80 newtons. Please don't worry too much about the newton setting at this point. We can discuss that if you like. To make things easier, multiple studies that we have conducted suggest 80 newtons is fine to start. If you want to play with this, you can. If you want to ask questions about it, you can. I actually use 80 for the vast majority of my patients, and it works very well. Okay. Um, starting at 80. Going over to the right-hand side of the screen, it is collecting data points. You can see here at 90 degrees, you have two dots, an 11.0 and a 7.5. That is the elongation, the resulting elongation in millimeters of your ligament at 90 degrees of flexion. So your lateral collateral ligament has a displacement of 11 millimeters. Your medial collateral ligament, 7.5. As you go to 10 degrees, 10.5 laterally. 7.0 medial. The other information you get from this curve is your overall alignment. You can see your leg alignment. It starts perhaps uh, at 110 degrees there. You can see perhaps four or five degree varus. It swings out peaking varus at about 70 degrees and comes back to about, you know, one degree or so at 10 degrees. This is the data you've acquired from the initial balance boss step. Two minutes elapsed. Now, we go to our femoral planning stage. This is where we take the information given to us, and we determine our various femoral preparation parameters and see what our resulting soft tissue balancing is going to be. And you can manipulate this as you wish in real time. Here, what we are shooting for is Remember back those earlier slides, patients do very well if they're less than one millimeter apart in measured ligament length at extension, mid-flexion, and flexion. So those are our guidelines that we are going to take here when we're in the operating room deciding what graph are we looking for. You can see here we have done pretty well. Again, this is not a difficult knee. Okay. 
So at 90 degrees, with these femoral parameters on the left, we're going to have 10 millimeter gap, 10 millimeter gap. At 10 degrees, 10 and 10. Okay. That all looks very good. Now, how we do this in the operating room, we have quite good confidence in our core and representative to do the vast majority of this for us. So what we're doing, we're resurfacing the patella right now while some of this is being done. Once I'm done with the patella, I look up at the screen. The first thing everyone looks at, because your eyes are just drawn to it, is that graph on the right. But you have to look. The graph may look good, but then you must shift your eyes to the left and see what did they do to get there. If you see seven degree valgus, you clearly are going to have to make some modifications. You may not want to accept seven degree valgus to give you that graph on the right. Just an example. So things to look for, the varus valgus alignment. How much distal femur was taken? What size femur this is? So on the leftmost screen, says size three, 12 millimeter distal reception medially, one degree valgus alignment. You must make sure you're fine with all of these parameters. Going to the middle screen. Well, if you want to check the size of your femur, this middle screen, you can actually flip to sort of a lateral view and you can take a look to see what that femur morphologically would look like and see if you're happy with it. You can look at your femoral flexion. These are all of the parameters that you can adjust in real time and then see what effect it has on that curve on the right. Once you have determined that you like what you've set it for and you like the resultant graph, then it's time to implement your plan. This is where my two assistants will take the robot and affix it to the femur. Okay? So this eye block axis alignment picture you see on the left that's what they are looking at. They are trying to get it correct in two planes, meaning everything is green, and then the second assistant tightens those two screws down. Once that's good, then it calibrates itself. Just a little diagram of this on the right. That takes just a minute or so. It will finish up in the proper position for your distal femoral cut, which you will then make, and then you will validate it. You can see here, we've lost a millimeter on our distal femoral cut, Everyone is different. I find that that happens not infrequently. I sometimes will account for that by taking an extra 0.5 millimeter or so on my planning screen. You can handle this however you like. Now, we have cut our femur. We have our trial femur, again, size three, in place. And then the final step is to put the balance bot back in, set it for 80 newtons and see, did we get what we planned for? And they are remarkably close. You can see the pre-op plan on the right, and then the resultant plan on the left. And then, as I stated previously, you can take your final stability assessment and compare it to your preoperative kinematics and Patients really like to see this. You like to see this. The other thing I should say is that with that balance bot in place at the end, you can set it in thickness or spacer uh, mode. So you can, after you've done your 80 Newton trialing and validation, you can then set it for a 10 millimeter spacer, 10 millimeter insert, and see if you like the stability. And if you don't, you can change it to 11 or 12. You do not need plastic tibial trial inserts to trial this knee, and that is a big time saver. Okay, total, 36 minutes. Now, again, we won't go through this in quite as much detail because we've gone through all of the steps in the previous case. This is an illustration of a more difficult knee, and, and it must be confessed the curves are not going to be quite as pretty, but it can handle this knee perfectly well and better than any other navigation system. So this patient had 9-degree varus, 7-degree flexion, and you can see that these green bars are a little bit wider, meaning that the knee was a little bit looser. This is our validation of our tibial cut. You can see this is a little bit more standard. Our previous case had 8 medial, 2 lateral. This is more of a standard varus knee. You can see we have a, a 10 lateral and a 1 medial plan. When we validated, we had 10 medial, excuse me, 10 lateral, 1.5 medial. Our balance bot is in. We have very slowly 
started at 90 degrees. We are set at 80 newtons bilaterally, and we are slowly bringing that knee from 90 very slowly out to 10, and we are collecting data points at this time. One thing I'd like to point out on this screen, if you look at the uh, curve on the right, see that green curve going way out into the varus realm at this point. So we're on to the femoral planning stage. It looks a little bit different. These are color-coded. If you are tight, it will show up and help you understand that you're tight. If you can't read that 4.5 um, millimeter uh, uh, gap there uh, in red. Red is tight. Green is determined to be uh, sort of within the you know, plus or minus one degree of where you might want to be. And if it's very loose, you'll see blue. Okay. So you see here. This is very tight medially, as expected, of course, for a significant varus deformity. Okay. So what I have done is rather than zero degree varus valgus, maybe in this particular case we might go one or two degrees of varus on the distal femur. You see we have done that. Okay. We've changed a couple of parameters. And it's nice because the minute you change them, you can see the resultant effect on the curve on the right. So we decided to go ahead and implement this plan. Now I'm going to go back one slide and show you one thing on the right here. So you see our gaps at 90 degrees, laterally 10, medially 10 at 90. At 10 degrees, laterally 10, medially Seven. What I do in this particular situation is rather than doing more bone cuts, this is just a technique that I use. I feel that I can probably, since all of the other gaps are 10 millimeters and I'm okay with the overall alignment, if we're a little tight, distally, medially, I can probably do a little soft tissue release here. Remember, we wanted a about one millimeter tighter medially than laterally. We know that from our data acquisition over the past couple of years with patient reported outcomes that those patients tend to do very well. So ideally, perhaps that seven would be a nine. And we can probably achieve that at the end with some soft tissue balancing. And that's what I decided to do at this point. That's also very helpful in the valgus knee where everything is perfect except the distal IT band just makes the lateral compartment tight in extension that's very nicely addressed at the end with a limited IT band release, another technique that can be very helpful there. Again, we've made our distal thermal cut. We're validating it. Okay. So now we have our trials in place. Okay. We have our bound spot set for 80 newtons, and we are applying 80 newtons of pressure to the lateral and medial collateral ligaments and we are seeing the resultant elongation and the overall leg alignment. That is the curve on the right. And then again, this is our pre-op plan. Very similar, very similar in terms of our gaps. And then again, final stability assessment compared to the pre-operative kinematic curve. Significant improvement. So this can be very helpful in these difficult cases. And this particular case didn't really take any significant additional time compared to case number one, with just the exception of a little attention to the distal medial soft tissues at the end. So the theme of this is that this is the natural evolution of the process that we have been going through for years with knee replacement. It's the next step in navigation. We knew we needed this way back when we had navigation and we said, well, let's cut the, the femur in a degree of varus to help with our end result. This takes that thinking and develops it into an accurate tool that we can use to implement this. The nicest thing about this, and what is unlike any other device that we have available currently, is that in real time, you can adjust before you do it your femoral parameters to see what your resultant 
uh, ligament balancing is going to be. So you really can plan and predict in real time in the operating room with very high level of precision what you're going to get. Every knee is different. Every surgeon is different. Every surgeon comes to this technology with their own preferences. This does not inhibit it. It enables you to use those and become a better surgeon. You will test your own hypotheses and see the results in real time and help the patient and improve outcomes in that fashion. We have efficient data capture, data-driven decision-making. Ideally, we are getting these data points. We are just starting to make some recommendations about ligament balancing and overall leg alignment, but there is so much more that we are currently collecting, and in time, we will have so many more recommendations to improve outcomes and minimize outliers. So clinical studies showing this, using the balance bot, have shown excellent overall outcomes. Balance has a greater impact on outcome than alignment, and clinically relevant joint balance targets for improved outcomes. Those are those one millimeter differences that we had targeted previously. Thank you very much, and that concludes the presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Anvil, for sharing some of those insights with us. Uh, we do have a few questions, but I encourage people to send in more if they have them. Uh, the first question is on that you mentioned uh, a couple of times about like your journey through navigation and how you um, and how you would try to cheat the system by adding a, a degree of varus or two to the femur or the tibia. Um, and currently, when you use the balance spot system, do you always target a neutral tibia? And if not, do you have a, any criteria for which you uh, deviate from neutral? Yeah, I still do. I still do. I, I guess I just have an, uh, perhaps a little bit of an old-fashioned sense that the tibia should be neutral alignment. Um, I know many people don't, and many people will accept even up to three degrees of varus, perhaps, on the tibia. Uh, in terms of longevity, I guess myself, I have some concerns about that. I always shoot for neutral. It's just, just something I do. If it happens to end up in perhaps one degree of varus, I certainly don't think that's sufficient to go back and recut it. I'm not going to worry about that. But it is true in the tibia. Myself, I shoot for neutral alignment. Right. Uh, we have another question on um, your rate of soft tissue releases. Have you uh, noticed a decrease or a change in the rate of soft tissue release prior to using the balance bot versus after using the balance bot? I don't think I have. I really didn't do very many soft tissue releases before. Um, it really was a challenge that I created for myself in the, the pre-balance bot navigation system. And I had gotten pretty good at predicting how these knees were going to behave. So the truth is I actually didn't do very many soft tissue releases before for the balance bot either. Um, so for me personally, probably not a large difference. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question on the 80 Newton balance that you chose in both flexion and extension and a question around how did you choose 80 Newtons and do you change that uh, value on a patient-specific basis? Uh, yes, certainly. So. 80 newtons was suggested to us at the very beginning based on cadaveric studies. So um, studies had been performed on cadavers with surgeons um, assessing uh, the feel of the ligaments, um, stability of the knee, um, and also, um, you know, elongation curves, et cetera. So, I don't have all of the, uh, the data on those studies, but the initial studies prior to implementation of this uh, initially suggested that 80 newtons was a good place to start. Now, I know there are some surgeons um, who have been involved in the study who have taken that information and have um, tried different, uh, you know, newton settings. For myself, I pretty much stick with 80 all of the time. I do know there are some surgeons who have different um, levels for their own reasons, inflection and extension. They like to set them differently for those two points. I don't do that myself. Um, 
There are very, very delicate patients on a couple of occasions. I've had some extraordinarily brittle rheumatoid patients with very delicate soft tissues. For that reason, not so much for balancing, I have brought the pressure down, perhaps to 60 or 70. Oh, the other time that you would want to do that, um, uh, if by chance, Everyone's patient, every patient's ligaments behave differently, and every once in a while you will run into a patient whose ligaments are a little bit more elastic than you might have predicted. And if you made a little bit larger uh, tibial cut than perhaps normal, and you find that your resulting gaps um, are very, very large, one way that you can manage that intraoperatively is bring the pressure down. Um, so that's another, it's not ideal, but that's another situation or scenario in which you might find yourself in that situation, bringing it from 80 down to 70 or 60. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we have a question around um, reaching terminal extension. So the question is, are you okay with sacrificing uh, some flexion for better extension uh, soft tissue tension? And um, have you noticed any changing in being able to achieve uh, full extension? I have not noticed any difference in the ability to achieve full extension. Um, perhaps some clarification on the question. Um, I'm not sure that I have seen a situation in which we've had to sacrifice flexion for that. Uh, it, it was really about whether you have... Um, have, uh, whether you've noticed it or whether uh, to, to balance the knee in extension, having those curves come in to be tighter in extension, and if you've noticed, you've been able to still get to full extension. Yes, we don't have a very high incidence of flexion contracture uh, at all. No. Again, every surgeon approaches this differently. I perhaps might arguably take a little more distal femoral cut than some other surgeons do. That's my technique. Um, but no, uh, I have not had any flexion contractures or a higher incidence of flexion contractures by balancing this knee at 10 degrees. That has not occurred. Okay, right. Um, one of the uh, unique aspects of you, Dr. Randall, is that you're one of our biggest PS users. I was wondering if you could comment on the uh, use of this system with a PS knee. Sure. It's very easy to use with a PS knee. Just a couple of additional steps. So if you go back to, um, you know, the case number one, for example, when we showed that we had prepared the femur so the, the robotic system was in place, we had made our femoral cuts, and then the next step was the femoral trial with the balance bot for the validation step. That is, of course, with a cruciate retaining femoral trial. There is a reason for that. We had found early on that if we attempted to fully prepare the femur, including, of course, cutting the box for the PS, there were some occasions where we would run into those two screws holding the robot on the end of the distal femur when we tried to make our distal femoral cut. So it didn't happen all the time, but it happened sometimes. So to accommodate for that, we do all of the registration and the validation, and then we actually remove the trackers and remove the pins from the distal femur, remove the robot. That actually helps in many ways with our efficiency, because remember that Mayo stand? All of that equipment is then, at this stage, before we're done with the case, taken off, put on that third Mayo stand, passed off to the representative in the room who begins breaking that down. Meanwhile, I am putting on the distal femoral box cut, preparing the box, and going from there. There have been no appreciable differences that we have been able to detect in any way in the definitive resultant balancing. Having used the second balance spot step with a cruciate retaining femur, it has not made any difference. Great. Thanks for, thanks for explaining that. We do have quite a few more questions here, but unfortunately we're just running up to six o'clock, so I'm going to have to call it time. Uh, before I thank Dr. Randall, I'd just like to point out that uh, tomorrow there is a further presentation on the OPS current technology. 
at um, 1 p.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time here in the U.S. That's going to be given by Dr. Vigorchik. But to wrap up this uh, new technology um, seminar session, I'd like to thank Dr. Randall one more time for for her presentation and her insights. Thank you very much, Dr. Randall. Thank you, Edgar. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of the day.